welcome. I'm Patty Arbrister. I am an agricultural educator over in Hinsdale, 7 through 12, and then I'm starting a agrarian food web. It's a consulting business that is ho hopefully helping people um, become more regenerative in their practices. Free the Seeds ladies asked me to present on pollinator alleys today. And how many have heard of a pollinator alley? So a few of you. Okay. Um, they have a lot of names I found out from my research. I like to call them beetle bumps because I think that sounds really cool. Why would we plant pollinators? What's some reasons why you guys would plant pollinators? The pollinating plants, right? That you your tract bees, what else? Honey bees, particularly. Oh, you don't like bumblebees? Well, I like them all. Oh, I like them all. <laughs> Good, because we wouldn't, we wouldn't like those native, yeah. native insects and bees and stuff. What other reason? Pruning plants require them. Pardon me? Pruning plants. Uh, yes, increase our production with them. What other reason? Same thing? Okay. Good. Well, you're going to learn something new today because there's a lot more to these pollinator alleys <laughs> than that. So, this is a short list of the benefits of them. Uh, nutrient runoff. They're considered now. These are mostly perennial plants, and some of them I I do put annuals in with them too. But most of the ones I researched were more perennial plants, so that they're staying in place, and then they're going to um, help you in multiple ways. Right. So uh, nutrient runoff. So in Iowa, for example, there's a big project going on there, and this lady did I think her PhD in the pollinator alleys. Uh, they call them pollinary strips there, where that they're able to buffer that um, chemical runoff and nutrient runoff out of their soils. This was a soil sample we put in the water this morning. And to give you an idea of sediment that's coming through the water, this one had uh, no-till, highly biological soil that's going to be more of the types of soils that was under these pollinator alleys, then this is more of our farm field soil. So when we have a strip of soil with these pollinating plants planted downstream of this, it's buffering the, these nutrients and these chemicals and whatever's in that water from going on through into the waterways. So that's the buffer. Um, nitrogen or nutrient runoff and that those nutrients can be multiple of things but nitrogen is highly soluble. Reduces soil erosion, increases the pollinators habitat, and I think key in vegetable production it's a beneficial insect habitat. Right? So we think of just the bees and the pollinators but the the beneficial insects are going to be key component. We'll talk quite a bit about that. And then the mycorrhizal rhizal services. Does anybody know? You guys know about mycorrhizal rhizal? We have 50% not yet, so we're making progress. A year or two ago, it would have been no, what in the world? Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that because they're huge services. Uh, it's going to enhance the water quality. Would you like to drink this? Yeah. I would. I would drink this. Do you want to drink this one? Uh, probably, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, we're going to increase the biodiversity. We're going to increase that above the soil with the plant leaf litter and the plants and what type of insects they um, encourage and what kind of habitat they make for those insects. And then the biologicals are going to increase dramatically in diversity with those different plants and different vertexidates coming out of those plants. Uh, it's going to reduce pollution because this is a huge pollution problem, right? So all of that uh, nutrient runoff is heading down to Mississippi and causing huge, huge problems. So we want to stop that from happening. Uh, reduce pest problems. We're going to talk about that. That's tied to our beneficial insect habitat and enhances plant communications. As you know, the plants are communicating and the, the insects are communicating, right? So this really enhances that, it has ties together with the mycorrhizal rising. And offers another income stream, right? So we could be selling uh, flowers or dried flowers or 
whatever from those. Um, it could be, you could have brambles in there, you could have berries, you could have all kinds of different stuff in those um, pollinator strips or beetle bumps to generate income from it. So this is some of the things I found in Paul on the internet. Um, the prairie strips is what they call them in Iowa. The beetle bumps is what they call them. And uh, a book that I'll, have, I'll show you the resources in the end of it, and I think there's a slide on that. And then uh, Eco Service Condor. <laughs> Condor, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then conservation strips, pollinator strips. Um, your riparian buffer and insectary strips. So you can call them really anything you would like to call them and get along. So they're mostly perennial plants, but we want them to be flowering throughout the season. So that's where this diversity comes in, so that we want to have them start early in the spring. I like um, start with a dandelion, for example. It's going to be really early in the spring. They are key, key food source for your bumblebees especially, because they're coming out of hibernation. It's the very first thing that they're going to be able to get some food and nectar from. And so those plants should not be um, getting destroyed, especially not before they're blooming and they can utilize them. After that, then yeah, you can keep them all off or whatever and let them come back. But they need to be an insect um, habitat and food source until you get another plant blooming in, in creating pollen. This is one of the, or two of the examples. Um, these are from the Lexicon of Sustainability. Has anybody ever seen that? They do the, this really cool artwork and they pick out a, a person that's really doing something phenomenal that has to do with sustainability and agriculture. And then they take all of these pictures and then they map them together and then they put all this message down there. It's really super cool. But these two, you can look these up on the web. But these two people are both um, are kind of founders in their area for, for putting these strips in. This lady too, um, she's in this book, The Attracting Beneficial Bugs <coughs> to Your Garden. That book is super, super good. It is a very good resource. Okay, this is some of what they look like. And so this is going to be very organic, right? And it's going to be very personalized because your place is going to look different than in any other place. And so you, there's just endless as to what it could look like and where you're going to use it, right? This one is in the city. This one is in Iowa, right alongside of a cornfield or a, a, a soybean field. This one is stripped more where that they can actually go in there and harvest flowers. And this one is intermingled right as a row right in your um, growing beds. Okay, so how do they work for the beneficials? They're going to offer shelter to the beneficial insects. I'm going to use the black wasp as an example. So black wasp is, uh, everybody familiar with them? They're, they are, will lay their egg inside an aphid and kill the aphid from the inside out. And so they're super beneficial. They'll kill 200 uh, aphids, one wasp. And they're tiny, they're littler than a mosquito. So they need tiny, tiny nectar source. So your, your sweet alyssum, is a perfect uh, source of food for them. But then your sweet listen also harbors um, predatorial spiders and things. Because it's small, it makes a great um, living mulch. And so it's a plant that needs to be in every garden. But it's used for multiple things and not just, oh, that's pretty and it smells great. Could you right? say something about what you mean when you say it? it's a harbor for predatorial spiders? Yeah. Yep, so there's spiders that are taking care of other bugs, and okay, so we so want it's, them. It's the desirable spiders. Got it. Desirable spiders. They sounded mean and nasty, but they call them predatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're going to predatory on other insects yeah. and keep other insects in check, okay. right? But they need <laughs> low growing, bushy plants to grow in, or to live in, to live out their life cycle in it. Right, so this is going to, plus these plants are going to tie to insects' life cycles, and they need to have a place that you're not going there and destroying partway through their life cycle, that we need to let them. These, these strips are kept year-round, year-to-year, year, you know, so that you're, you're giving them their, their space and their place. So the food, water, shelter thing. Um, 
They need uh, different flowering plants, flowering throughout the growing season, like we said. Space and time to live out their life cycle. And diversity of plants attract to the diversity of insects. And we want all of that. We need the whole insect world to be intact. Right now it's in danger. It's, it's collapsing throughout the world, the insects are. And we need to figure out ways that we're going to help them keep going so that everything else can stay in balance and keep going. There's only one pest to every couple hundred, or there was only one pest to every couple hundred other insects, right? Those other insects are doing services for us that most of the time we don't even understand, right? We just need to finally give them a place. When you drive from eastern Montana and go all the way to um, eastern North Dakota before you get into trees and stuff, there's no prairie. The only prairie that's left is in, in, in patches where we're still doing bee production. It's all tilled, and they've tilled the fields bigger and bigger and bigger where there's, the, the bees can't even fly across them, right? So they need places desperately to be living, and we need to be providing them for them. But the benefits we're going to get out of it is way bigger than just the honeybee or the feel good I'm helping the insects. You're going to get a lot of soil health benefits out of it. So the diversity of roots are super important. This is just a, a plant demonstration that I did and did it until so all of those roots are leaking root exudates into the soil and feeding the soil food wet. So the more roots you got, the better. And they're going to all be connected through mycorrhizal rising. So it is a fungal network that's kind of like fiber optics that um, is in the soil and it, it is going through from one root to another root to another root all through the soil like a like a fiber optics network of masses though of it and it is going to be able to provide you 20 percent of the water it's also a communicator how it communicates is uh, I'll give you an example of uh, drafts in Africa so these drafts like a particular tree let's call it tree A right so a draft comes along and it's, it's foraging on top of tree A the tree A is like, holy crap, I need to stop that from happening. It sends chemicals up into its canopy, turns the, the leaves bitter. The draft's like, oh, I don't like that. The draft heads on, goes to the next one. The chemical signal's already up. The chemical signal's already up 200 foot away before it can get to a tree that hasn't got the chemical signal yet. All from the mycophysal rhizal network being connecting it and signaling, hey, <laughs> don't let them do that to you. They'll signal for a drought too. They can signal for all kinds of stuff. And so you want to keep them intact. I and mean, the best way to keep them intact is to have a perennial plantings of diversity. And then they're going to run through each other. The plants re are receptive to it because the plants are capitalizing from it, they're bringing them nutrients and minerals and stuff through the network. So we want to keep that intact as best as we possibly can. And so these pollinator strips or beetle bumps, if we would put them through the middle of our um, garden or our, our bigger farm fields, you know, like our production vegetables, if we put them right down through the middle of it, then we're going to be able to get 20 foot at least running out the side with the mycorrhizae rising coming out the side that's going to colonize all those other plants that are in your planting that are your annual plants that you're disturbing or whatever to plant they're going to be able to run this fibro network if you put them 40 foot apart you're going to be crossing over so you're going to get the benefits of it but you're still got 80 percent of your growing area is your annual plants so like that the strip. established like a that's what I would recommend. Okay. There's all kinds of ways they do it, but that's what I'd recommend. I'll show you one here, too. This will give you a little bit idea of how massive it is. Where I've got the green, that's the root of the plant. Everything else is a mycophysal rhizome network. And that's just giving you a small example. This is just one plant. So does this work very similar to like how mycelium works? Yes, this is a mycelium. 
Okay, okay. So, so they all fungal, is that right? This is mycorrhizal rising. Right. Yep. Okay. It's a fungal, yep, fungal network. So some examples here in Montana. This is Doug Crabtree. He's the president of the Montana Organic Association. He's a big farmer, um, big production farmer. So you know, I don't know, thousand acres or something. I'm not quite sure what his acreage is, but big, big tillage type equipment. And he put in these strips, and has been able to get all of these benefits out of putting those strips in. So I think he's probably got two combine heads or three widths between them. I don't know what his measurements are, but that'll give you a good idea of how they're getting used in a bigger setting. He's got a lot of uh, native plants in, intermingled, and sunflowers are a native plant in Montana, and so we do want to capitalize on those native plants as much as we possibly can. That's going to reduce your wind, too. Um, wind's a huge problem in us, for us in eastern Montana, so it's a consideration. These really help that. Um, having those a uh, little bit of buffers for wind is going to help with your pollinators, too. And a fight to win is bad. So other examples in large production, especially in the grape yards, grape grape vineries, and in um, the blueberry and raspberry producers up in Oregon. Um, lots of them are adapting this practice very, very quickly, where that they they're just doing an inner crop. Um, it's like a cover crop, but they got enough uh, perennials in there that they're not having to till it up or anything. They just mow it when they want to control what's going on. But then they can control the nectar source for their bees and pollinators and stuff. Can you tell me why you <laughs> mow at night if there's bees? Yes, they mow at night because the bees are feeding on the flowers during the day, so they mow at night. So the bees will be at home. Yeah, the bees will be in there. The honey bees will, you know, and the other bees have dispersed. I don't know where they live. We need a lot more research on it, but. If you're interested in insects and bees, you should look up um, Jonathan Lundgren on uh, YouTube. So he's a doctor and just phenomenal about the whole bee thing. And so you should look him up on the, on the web. So what are they doing to keep the ground so bare right at the base of the ground? That's mulch. These ones mulch theirs. That's a mulch around the, the, the um, grapes and then Cover so is do you if you mow during the day did you would you chop up a lot of bees or just a matter of disappointing them? Depends on how slow you move. <laughs> Here I come. <laughs> you know, if you're going really fast, I think you're going to do some damage. <laughs> so, but serious by evening, question. By evening, a lot of bees and most pollinators and stuff have went wherever they go for the night. Okay, so so the thought is if you mowed that down at noon, there'd still be a lot of bees coming, thinking that there were flowers there, yep. but they'd be disappointed and waste their time. Well, you're not going to get the whole thing mowed in one day, are you? Right, right, right. Butterflies. So it's just to be a better practice after the bees or early in the morning before they come out, you know, so that you're not. It's a good thought. Yeah. But you want to leave some. Right. Mm -hmm. These guys are in production ag, and so they're 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 mowing them. But most of these pollinary strips are not mowing unless you're trying to control weeds. So when in your establishing year or two, you may need to mow them to control some weeds, depending on the plant and what you're trying to do. So this is how the diversity of the roots matter. This is a great poster, by the way. Uh, that's turf grass on the far side. Right, so your Kentucky bluegrass. Mm -hmm. I really don't think we should be having turf grass in our lawns. We should be having um, blue grandma grass and white Dutch clover and low growing native plants that we are not having to water or fertilize and reduce lots of this chemical necessity that we've created. And that's going to really cut down on your water dramatically. So I think blue grandma is on this example. But it's a bunch of grass, right? And it's got a deep root system, probably like the one in the middle. I don't think this point or oh, for some reason, I thought it works on this way. If we had a plant like this with really a lot of fibrous roots under it. This was the rice grass example. So to give you an idea, that's, I think that's ironwood, that how much deeper the root systems could go into these plants. And that's what we want. So it improves water quality. It's 
to, that soil is doing a lot of water cleansing. Right now, our, a lot of our agricultural soils is really broken and it is not getting clean properly because the water cycle is not functioning quite right. And so until we can get those fixed, then we're not going to be able to get this clear water going down the riverways. We're going to get that cloudy example. Build the soil biology rodexidase, uh, sequestering carbon, and your mycorrhizal riser refuge. So refuge means that if we go in there, if we decide, well, okay, we have to disturb and we've got to chill to put in whatever the crop is, right, we're going to destroy the, the fungal network. But it will recolonize from the sides, mm -hmm. just like I gave you the example of going out 20 foot out into the field. And so you're going to want to encourage that and try to, not to destroy it too much. Switchgrass is starting to be a popular plant that they are um, looking into for bioenergy. But um, it's surprising how many um, pollinators and stuff go to grasses. And I'm not even sure why they do, but they do. So the more, even the more of them, the types of different ones you can plant, the better off you would be. So this one's an organ. And I haven't researched this farm that well, but the, the, there's a blueberry farm in Oregon that used to be the largest commercial chemical blueberry producer. Now he is the largest regenerative agricultural producer. I think it's Sunset. And uh, they, he's got videos on the web too on regenerative agriculture and how they're doing it with their blueberries and stuff. But they, they are all starting to put these flowers, flowering plants in their um, alleyways. Okay, this is excellent research by David Eric, or Dr. Eric um, Benin in USDA over in California. This is a huge valley in California where they're growing lots of lettuces. And this is his organic farm. And he did this big research on sweet alyssum as to how much of it we need to have so that we've got the nectar source He's working with hoverflies. Hoverflies take care of lots of aphids too. Hoverflies are the fly that looks like a bee. So we, we think it's a bee, but it's a hoverfly. And so we were, really want them in our growing areas. So he was able to do several years of research and figure out if he had 8% sweet alyssum, and this is all romaine lettuce, so it's a monocrop. But if he had 8% sweet alyssum in there, then he, didn't, he wouldn't have any aphid problems. So they've been able to stay organic and not have to use any pesticide, even organic pesticide, because of the sweet alyssum planting intermingled with it. So he just does a double planting strip every, ten. every spot that he needs, yes. Every 10 rows. Yep, every 10 rows. And then you'll see, he, i got another picture here, but he's got a hedgerow that goes all the way around that's perennial bushes and um, flowering plants. Mm -hmm. and so that's how wide theirs is. But they're doing this whole organic field without, without having to use any insecticides of any kind. So he's creating the house and the place and the food for all of those beneficial insects to take care of all of that organic land. He's got a lot of perennial sh um, shrubs, but those could be ones that you're harvesting, right? Here we could be having blueberries in there and harvesting blueberries in those plantings. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. And once they get them established, they're not having to water them, right? They're perennial and they're native. And so the, the work we're having to do for them after we get established is hardly anything. We have to do some pruning on his shrubs. But these are the um, beneficial wildlife that he says is the, the best ones that he is um, harboring, which includes our hawks and gopher snakes. Or I think we call them bull snakes. But to, they will go in and I would take care of their our moles and bulls and gopher problems by having them in place. But, they need a place to be able to get away from people and lawnmowers and stuff, you know. So this little bit of wild area is actually very, very good. This is it, the hoverfly up on the other side there. We have a lot of them in our school garden and the kids think they're bees, but they can look close and identify that, oh, that's a fly. So they're just trying to mimic a bee so that other stuff leaves them alone. But they're eating a lot of aphids. A lot of them are utilizing cover crops wherever they're not in production with their soils. Or, you know, so if they, they would normally have a 
far, fair year where they're not they're selling or whatever, they're going to put a cover crop in instead. And I would encourage you to let the cover crop go all the way to flower and then terminate it if you're going to terminate it. Or let winter terminate it and then let it become the leaf litter mulch for the next year. But it's feeding your soil the whole time, right? And it can be feeding your... That looks like a mix. Is that a mix? That is a mix, yeah. yeah. Peas and yep. something. Winter yes. Wheat. And you want to plant mixes. Okay. Um, preferably eight species or more. And um, Dr. Christine Jones' research has kind of proven that if we can get over eight species in the mix, then we get something they call synergy. And every plant in the mix is better together than apart. So every plant performs better in the mix than if you play, planted it in a single planting. And just incredible. And so it's like this example that we had on the, the pull-up <laughs> is that all of those different roots are doing root, different root exudates. Each plant sending different signals and getting different well, biology working for it and coming and feeding the plant. So that's where our, our uh, bionutrients are going to come from for, to get back into our foods is these deep-rooted plants and get the biology working for us and them mining it and getting that plant healthier and getting those vitamins and minerals and nutrients back in that plant for them us or the animal to eat and then us eat it or us eat the plant itself. Right? That's a missing link right now with the monocultures and the chemical farming that's been taking place is that we're, we're just missing that, right? So we've got to get it back from the soil food web. These are some plants that um, Dr. Ben in, in California highly recommends. I grow all of those for the same reasons. Our buckwheat I'll plant anytime I need a fast cover. It's, it's going to be blooming in 45 to 50 days. But it will also set seed in about 62 days to 65. So as soon as it's done flowering and the, the bees are off of it, then you need to terminate it. Unless you're going to be wanting seed going on your ground and it being becoming in the environment and growing on its own. So it's very quick to seed. Pollinators just love it though and all kinds of different bugs are coming to it. And so it's, it's fantastic. Um, anything in the dill type family in your carrots, I'll let carrots go to seed too. So all those umbrella type seeds are, are taking care of beneficial insects that couldn't get nectar from say a nasturtium or a, a bigger flower. Phalangia the same way. Or coriandi. So here's a beetle bank. These guys are out of Oregon State University and this is a PDF I included in the, the slideshow so if you want to Free seed is going to have it. You can download it. So this teaches you how how they recommend putting them in. I think I would probably put it in with a no-till drill, but there's all kinds of ways that you could do it. I think I would actually grow a lot of those um, grasses and your forbs and stuff and transplant them rather than from seed. But some plants that I like to include. Definitely branching sunflowers, especially in a garden setting or uh, or organic farmer setting. I use them on the windward side of, of the beds, so it's going to protect my beds from the west and also um, shade some of that west sun. So I put a pretty dense, heavy planting of branching sunflowers. I like the branching ones because as we cut those flowers off, then we're going to get more of them. So it's got cut and come flowers, so the more we cut, the more we're going to get. And so I don't plant a single head sunflower, so I plant these guys. Their seeds are less tinier, but you're going to have lots of, lots and lots of pollinators. So you need a pollinator for every little seed on those sunflowers. So they'll bring in pollinators that you've never seen before. And 90% of them, I don't know what, who they are or what they do, but they're all good. <laughs> And so they're just like a beacon. I use them on the outside of my um, school garden to draw in the pollinators from the whole community. And so they come for them sunflowers, but once they get there, they're like, oh wow, there's, there's some buckwheat, and there's some facilia, and there's all this different stuff, and then they stay. And if I have to tell, show my kids a pollinator issue, I have to go to somebody else's garden to show them one. Uh, we have zero pollination issues in the school gardens. 
So Phacillia, I actually brought some seed to the fair here, so hopefully some of you picked it up. Um, super fantastic plant. Tall. You get knee high oh. if you're. It's in good soil and got good okay. microbes working. About knee like high. But don't believe. If you if it's uh you've got it if you let it self seed it's going to have be too close together. It's going to need thinned out to get that bushy. But it will bloom twice a year, and you could actually have a seed off of it probably twice a year. How so, high you say it was? Uh, about knee high is maximum amount. What species are you working with here? What's that? What species are you working with? Of the Facilia? Mm -hmm. That I don't know for sure. Uh, got the seed source from Johnny Seeds Organic okay. Supply. Gotcha. So, and it's the one the cover crop guys are using throughout the yeah, United States and Canada. Yeah, you would know more than I would. Cool. I didn't know because there's so many different ones. Yeah. So, know. good to know. But I'm using the one that Johnny Seeds started. And I think that most of the cover crop guys are, I mean, when I go to their fields and stuff, that's what it looks like. But I know the, it will be a buzz of insects and pollinators. Love the Rocky bee, Rocky Mountain bee plant. Native, right? So love to get it going. In the, the bees love that too, obviously. And of course, these two are rock stars. Mm -hmm. uh, rubber rabbit brush is fantastic. It's a perennial native shrub and uh, it, blooms relatively late and it'll have full seed way close, I don't know, what, maybe November, it'll be pretty late, right? But you could harvest quite a bit of seed off of it. So a lot of these native forbs and stuff I think are really, could be lucrative, right? You find out a lot of them are very expensive, so you could be growing seed and marketing it. Your bee bonds, that whole family, they just love, they're fantastic, multiple uses for herbs and all kinds of things. Bird's foot tree foil, it's a, a nitrogen fixing plant that I think is really good. Um, we have trouble to grow it there because we're not as wet as you are, but I think here, I've seen on organic farms here in their walkways and stuff, here and all the way down into Bozeman and stuff that I think is super good. Is that not a, I always thought that was a weed. Lots of people think it's a weed. But lots of people think white Dutch clover in your lawn is a weed, <laughs> and it's a rock star in your lawn. <laughs> This could tolerate being in your lawn too once you got established and you, you didn't mow it continuously. Spreads pretty, pretty good. Yep, but it's feeding it's nitrogen, yeah. it's doing good things. And so sometimes we just kind of step back and, and figure out the difference between what we think is a weed and if, it, if we can live with it and it's got another benefit, then I classify it not as a weed anymore. So. A little bit of open our minds a little bit about some of these plants. Sandworms, another nitrogen fixing plant. They're growing it like crazy in Lewistown for hay. So it's a hay um, crop that you could um, supplement instead of alfalfa. Oh, yeah. So they're growing it and replace the alfalfa. Some of our lands have had too much alfalfa grown on them or that we just keep taking, taking, taking every year and we're breaking the law of return. That some of our soils under those alfalfa fields are in horrible shape. So let's think a little bit differently and get some other plants. Bees just love it. It's, it's just gorgeous. And it produces a lot of seed. It will sell seed. So in these situations where we're putting in a beetle bump, we want them to sell seed and take care of themselves and build their own community, right? We may plant eight or 10 or 12 or 14 different plants, and we may get six or seven that are dominating the planting. As long as they're flowering throughout the season, then it's okay. They're gonna kind of adjust to our environment. Yellow cone flower and purple cone flower, both of them native. And don't forget the bunch grasses. In our example over here, where you looked at the root system, you're like, yes, we want some of them in our plantings, definitely. Uh, the blue gramma is the one that I would recommend for lawns, and ours it only gets about this tall because we've got some compacted soils, and we're not getting a lot of uh, moisture there. So we got places we don't even have to mow it. But if you mowed it once or twice a year, that'd be all you'd have to mow. It's versus our our hybrid grasses that we're a slave to. How 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 is it to just cut top seed these over an additional uh, an existing lawn? An existing lawn is going to outcompete them for the water at the soil surface uh -huh. because they're the existing uh, 
grasses are really short grass and short roots and they're going to uh, take up the moisture away from these guys when these guys are trying to get established. So I plant these guys and then I transplant them as plugs to really get them going. But your lawn grass, his roots are about that deep, right? Where these bunch grasses, roots are going to be five, six, some of them eight foot deep. But we got to give them time to get established. So is the the early moist season isn't enough for them to get? Well, I tried to try to follow Mother Nature when she put grass seed down. With fall. 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 Mm -hmm. So if we plant in the fall. But you're gonna to need to get that Kentucky bluegrass or whatever your lawn grass is. I, I solarize it. I'll put a tarp or um, cardboard over the top of it. Get it killed out through the winter, right? Put it on the fall and the winter. Then in the spring, then I can transplant these plants into it. So you guys got a great resource here in the valley where they got the native plant center. So yes. How about the deep rooted plants interaction with orchard trees? With your orchard trees? Yes. I would probably do them as a beetle bump on the outside and then go with more your smaller, or not smaller, but not as aggressive root system, maybe for your alleys, you know, and your, your walkways between your, your trees. But the, they're using them in several orchards. Most orchards are moving that way quickly instead of having to come follow that ground or till it. And they're moving back toward planting it and planting it and flowering plants. So whatever's going to work for your environment. Right? Mine's way different because we got only 12 inches of rainfall, 12, 14 inches of rainfall. Where you guys got a lot more than we do. Uh, blue bunch wheatgrass. Anybody know anything about that grass? You live on the west side here. And it's your state grass. Yeah. <laughs> oh, also know this. Learned this in seventh grade. <laughs> state grass. There you go. Okay. And then uh, basin ryegrass, oh my gosh, in a wet spot, that thing is going to get this tall and be this big. You're going to think, wow, it's an imported grass or some kind. But it's it'll compete huge. with reed canary. Um, maybe. If you could tarp it and then. Possibly. Do these um, all need full sun? Most grasses like sun. It's so, right. I have a situation where a neighbor cleared right up to the boundary line. Mm -hmm. And then said, please plant trees so that we have a, buff, a visual buffer. Took all the trees down on his side. Well, that was his fault. <laughs> I, I know, but this is the way people do it. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, since there's going to be a lot of light coming in from his side of the boundary line, mm -hmm. um, it's east and south basin, if I couldn't plant some of these grasses, that would go Yeah, down. and uh, basin rye grass is a bunch of grass. That means it's going to stay in a bunch and it's not going to travel with Renomous mm -hmm. root system, right? Yes. I've never seen blue gum over here. Has it never been given a chance, or has it had problems on the west side? Well, I think in your your with your tree landscape, right? I think we're pretty high fungal in our soils because of the trees. It, we understand the successions. Mm -hmm. so we go from bare soil to the weeds to the to the grasses, then to our blueberries and our brambles and then to deciduous trees and then the pine forest. So you're way high fungal compared to our grasses. Our grasses are back here closer to one to one um, bacteria to fungi ratio. And this soil, I haven't looked at it under the microscope, but I anticipate it to be way higher in fungal than that. So that would need to be adjusted if our target is to grow our grasses and that, that stay in that place. Right, and not let it move toward trees. Because it naturally, I think if we left, what would it grow? Trees. trees. If I left in eastern Montana, it would grow grass. Mm -hmm. Along with these native forbs, they'd all come back if we left. And then we would have to graze more like the bison did though. You know, we take they'd only take one third. And they're always on the move. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford to stop. Right? They're gonna get eight if they stopped. So they're taking the top third of the plants off. They didn't get to pick and choose. Oh man, I love this blue bunch wheatgrass. They've loved it so much it's almost gone in the state. Our cows have. Because they get the choice. Because we're in a big pasture. We're out there for 90 days. They're going to go 
be selective and pick out exactly what they want. So exactly what they want has gotten overgrazed and everything else got undergrazed in the certain situation that we got right now until we can change our grazing rotations differently. But those bison would only be taken in the antelope, deer, they're only taking the top part of it, the very best of everything, right, that they could get. Then they're punching in a third of it and another third standing. That's how our soils evolved. That's how our prairies evolved, and that's how our grass, and that's how we stay in that one-to-one -one ratio. And we don't get enough moisture to move to the tree succession like you guys have. So, it, I didn't answer your question. I don't know if it's here. Maybe in a prairie setting, right, that's stayed that way for quite a while. What native grasses do come up in your meadows? About year, blue bunch. Good. It's on the mountainside. Nice. Those are great grasses. So I would guess that I probably, I don't yeah, good. I would guess that blue ground would probably would grow here. I'd grow it as a plug and transplant it into a clean bed. Try it that way. Okay, or if it's a lawn situation, right, you'd have a clean bed and we're going to plant it, right? Plant that that is our target grass, and we're going to water it as needed to get it established, along with your clovers and stuff. To go with it. Okay, so how should how big should the beetle bump be? So they're going to all be different, just like you and I are different. My garden is different than your garden. So if it's a garden setting, then I'm going to put them in a bunch of three to five plants together, and have multiple of them all around my landscape. All right, out of fiber size, we're going to want one plant in the middle or along the edges of the fields. So you want to want a row for every 10 to 20 acres, like the beetle bump row. And if it's are 10 feet wide? I would say so, 10, 12 foot, depending on your drill. If you're using a 12 foot drill, then it's 12 foot. Unless you're planting your head row, then that's going to be up to you. Back to our scenario with the sweet alyssum and the monocrop, though, so it's going to be 8% of the field. So if I'm an organic farmer, I don't have control of the hedgerow because I'm going to farm from fence to fence. I'm going to want 8% of sweet alyssum, but I would be putting other flowers in there along with it, not just the monocrop. But sweet alyssum is really good because it's going to bloom early and bloom all through the season. But I would give them a selection. Do you guys like eating just one food every day? Oh boy, dog food again. Every day of the year. <laughs> so think diversity, the more diversity the better. Uh, especially for our soils and the insects. Well. Uh, I have a PDF in here. This is another example of how to start them. So you can start your seeds inside transplant in, in spring or plant by direct seeding in the fall. So if I did the direct seeding in the fall, I guess I would probably do it in, in August or early September and then water it, right, get it established. But nature throws the grass seed on top of the soil and lets it come up in the spring. So you to kind of think about how you're going to do it. Um, here's some other suggestions, and they're going to be kind of up to you guys, but all of these are our nitrogen fixing plants. So yeah, ideally, I would like to see, you know, if I was a cover crop, maybe 20% or even up to 30, 40% of a nitrogen fixing plant. Especially if we haven't got our soil health quite in place yet. We want to be encouraging them. So these are good examples of them. Uh, these slides are going to be shared with you guys through Free the Seed. So where you can take a picture of the slides. Uh, all of the different clovers are good. They're blooming at different times and a lot of them have different sizes and all kinds of good stuff. Crimson clover, you guys seen it? <laughs> it's just gorgeous. It's, it could be a stellar plant all by itself and just like yeah, just. I don't know how to tell crimson and red clover. I don't know which one I crimson have. is uh, got a long bloom, and your red clover is the big round, real, what I call real because we hate it when we're kids, but it's a huge bloom, and it's predominantly pink to purple color with huge leaves. So your um, crimson clover doesn't look anything like it at all. So if you look them up on the web, you'd see the difference of them. But they're, they're going to attract different insects because of the size of those flowers. So, uh, These are just some more suggestions that I would be conscious of when I put in an annual cover crop that I do get in some um, C4 plants so that they're doing uh, photosynthesis differently than our C3s. 
So your sunflowers, your um, sorghum sedan, your millet, I like to have them in the mix. For cool season, I really like your winter turtle So it does a phenomenal job of building soil structure. Don't forget the buckwheat, it's gonna go to seed. So I plant it every single year, but I am conscious of what it's doing. So you may want to mow it down with your flail mower or if you're gonna plant it, but it, it's something like if you if we need, let's say we harvested in September, early September, and we just took out the beets or whatever, and now we have open soil for the winter, plant buckwheat, you got 45 days before you're gonna have big killing frost, then you've got the whole, um, that whole 45 days you're feeding the soil food web with the root oh, exudates. It dies on its own. And it'll die on its own before it goes to flower, to seed. So think about ways, if I got 45 days, I plant it, right? Even if a few of them come up, they're helping feed that biology. Uh, Facilia is actually very cool tolerant, I got a smoke room there, but very cool tolerant and um, plant it, if I just, I got a bed that I just let it do its thing, it comes up super early in the spring. And in the greenhouse right now, I have a greenhouse with a heated floor from hot water. And back in January, when it was warm, <laughs> not February, but in January, it was already emerging and growing and doing well. And a plant that was in a planter that we had moved in from the fall into the greenhouse was, was getting ready to bloom. And so very cold tolerant. More examples. That's so pretty. Yeah, and those are California poppies of state flower. Here's some more. I love the one with the intercropping insectary strip habitat. That's crimson clover. So this uh, plant right here. That's crimson. That is, oh yeah. Yeah, isn't that gorgeous? And that'll, that's a perennial. See, it's not a biennial. Most uh, clovers are biennials. Will that choke out? Uh, they're using red clover on organic farms and sweet clover yeah. and alfalfa to choke out thistle, right? So uh, your Canadian thistle needs lots of competition and you need to get organic matter built back up in the soil and get your microbes in the soil and deal with compaction. Mm -hmm. If you can do those things with other plants and it having a fight with them, then that's a good thing to kind of keep them down. Mob grazing is working fairly well. They're getting a lot of uh, tall clovers in there and stuff and then mob grazing. But that's starting to help with those, um, both bindweed and Canadian thistle. But those, that mob grazing is getting a lot of um, organic matter, you know, manure, pea, plant material worked into the ground, right? So that's why it's working, it's speeding things up dramatically. Uh, just some more, they call them so many different things on the internet, I thought they'd just throw a bunch of them out here so you could look at them and look them up yourself. But this is the conservation biocontrol concept. So they have enough flowering plants that they're going to have so many predatorial insects taking care of the pest insect that the pest insect's not going to be involved in the game very much at all. Is there any questions on some of how we're going here? Uh, this is another native plant, dotted gay feather. I'm sure plant did. Bees love it. Flower seems to flower for a long period of time. This is where uh, the example from Iowa, you know, everybody been to Iowa? They've got rolling hills, right? So we, we have some of the soil is running off, and so they're putting these in as buffers to be able to buffer it and establish a buffer zone that's going to clean the water like that and stop any of those chemicals from running off and getting into the waterways. So they're using them as buffer zones. And this is just an example of how good it can work. So the next one just chemicals going into the plant that's going into the, the beneficial insects? On theirs? Yeah. It's, uh, you'll have to ask Dr. Jonathan Lundgren that question. That he does thorough research on insects. He's a USDA, was a USDA researcher, and he's bailed ship on the USDA, and now he's got Blue Dasher Farm, and he's doing regenerative agricultural research, researching what the farmers need to know. Mm -hmm.